We are five casts, one people. We stand united, dedicated wholly to the greater good. As we progress, we will encounter further barriers. We will overcome them. Our future is now. Believe in our destiny. From Ethereal Supreme Aunva. The T apostrophe AU Empire, pronounced Tau as in Wow, also spelled T H U Empire without the apostrophe in older imperial records, is a rapidly expanding multi species Xenos stellar empire situated within the Imperium of Man's Ultima Segmentum near the eastern fringes of the Milky Way galaxy. It lies within the reach of the Astronomicon. The Tau Empire was founded by the Tau caste called the Ethereals, who lead it in the name of and in accordance with the utilitarian philosophy they have named the Greater Good or Tauva in the Tau lexicon. A large and growing number of other intelligent alien races have allied themselves with the Tau within their empire. The empire itself has suffered many raids from the orcs and also seemed to lie in the path of several Tyranid splinter fleets of Hive Fleet Kraken. The Tau claim to be a peaceful species when possible, asking if others will join their cause voluntarily instead of fighting against them. However, if their peaceful overtures are refused, the Tau may well decide to conquer a planet and add it to their growing stellar empire for the greater good, searing the flesh from the bones of anyone who stands against their benign intentions. Tau society is divided into a number of castes, each responsible for managing a specific aspect of their civilization. Their central motivating ideal is that everyone in their empire, regardless of their species or culture of origin, will work for the collective betterment of everyone else, an almost mystical philosophy that is embodied in the greater good. The Tao are the dominant species of their empire an interstellar polity which is also composed of several other different intelligent species including the crude of Pech, the insectoid Vespids of the world of Vespid, the nomadic psychers of the Nikasar, and many others. However, there are now also several human septs in the Empire derived from conquered Imperial humans or humans who voluntarily joined the Empire because they were impressed by the concept of the greater good. These people are known as the Gu Veza in the Tao lexicon, and they are considered amongst the most vile of traitors and heretics within the Imperium. The Tao are a relatively young species. It has been only 6,000 Terran years since Imperial Inquisitors first noted that the Tau had only just mastered fire and the wheel, and they have evolved rapidly over the past few standard millennia. Unlike other intelligent, star-faring species, they have made remarkable leaps in technology and now represent a real threat to imperial domination in their region of the galaxy.
The exact date of the founding of the Tao Empire in the Imperial Calendar is unclear. However, the way in which the Tao were united as a species is a well-known tale. What is known is that only 6,000 standard years ago, in the 35th millennium, an Adeptus Mechanicus Explorator fleet discovered the Tau homeworld of Tau and determined that its population of intelligent Xenos were a primitive people at the Stone Age level of development, having only just mastered fire. Since then, the Tau have developed very rapidly into a space-faring species. Earlier in their history, during a period known as the Montau, the Tau were a culture built upon warring tribes. During this time, their legends tell of the first appearance of the Ethereals at the city of Fiotaun. The fortress city of Fiotaun was under assault by Tau warriors from the plains. Though negotiation had been attempted, the fierce plains warriors would settle for nothing less than the annihilation of the city. For five long years, the inhabitants held off the savage assaults with their thick walls and plentiful cannons. However, disease and starvation began to take their toll. As the tide of the siege turned, two mysterious Tau appeared. One made his way into the camp of the plains warriors, exuding a quiet authority that no Tau was able to resist. Soon, the leader of the plains warriors was persuaded to parley with the settled Tau of Fiotau. Similarly, the other mysterious figure made his way deep into the fortress. Within a few short hours, the gates stood wide open, and the Tau of both sides stood ready to talk. The ethereal spoke of the importance of peace and understanding between all Tau. They described a greater good that each must strive towards. The besiegers and the besieged quickly agreed with the ethereals, and a truce was reached. Across the world of Tau, ethereals emerged, each with the same quiet authority and message of harmony and cooperation. With the Tau united, they were able to rapidly develop their civilization's technology ultimately attaining space-faring capabilities. The Tau Empire soon expanded its borders through a series of so-called sphere expansions. The Tau Empire has gone through five main phases of expansion as of the era Indomitus in the 41st millennium. These phases are marked by Tau military campaigns during which new worlds and star systems are colonized, conquered, or sometimes peacefully persuaded to accept the greater good through diplomacy and a manifest demonstration of the benefits provided by advanced Tau technology. Apart from the star systems directly colonized and exploited by them, which are known as sets, the Tau Empire also includes the worlds and star systems belonging to the species of the Krut, Vespid, and the Nikasar. It is currently unknown if the leagues of Votan Prospect called the Demiurg by the Tau are full members of the Empire allies or mere trading partners. The Empire is composed of over 20 fully developed sets and around 100 settled worlds. 
but the exact number and most of their names are unknown to the Imperium. A known splinter faction among the Tau are the Farsight Enclaves, founded beyond the Damocles Gulf by the Tau commander Farsight against the orders of the Ethereals. More recently, some worlds and star systems of the Imperium have been conquered by the forces of the Tau, while a handful have even seceded from the Imperium outright and pledged their allegiance to the Tau Empire and the greater good. The Damocles Gulf Crusade The Damocles Gulf Crusade, also called the Damocles Crusade, was the first military conflict fought between the Imperium of Man and the rapidly expanding Tau Empire in the Litesh sector of the Ultima Segmentum near the galaxy's eastern fringes during the 41st millennium. The conflict essentially ended in a stalemate, as the Imperium was forced to conclude its military offensive early to deal with the encroaching Tyranid threat while the Tau saw to begin diplomatic negotiations with the Imperium to show humanity the benefits to be had by accepting the greater good. Before the Crusade, members of the Tau water caste had established trade agreements with Imperial worlds on the frontier of the Tau Empire near the Damocles Gulf region of the Ultima Segmentum in the Galactic East, and exchanges of goods and technology were common. Alarmed by the threat of alien contamination, the Administratum readied a suitable response. Almost a Tehran century later, the Damocles Crusade smashed into Tau space, destroying several outlying settlements and pushing deep into the Empire. When the Imperial fleet reached the Tau Sept world of Dal Eith Prime, however, the Crusade ground to a bloody stalemate as the formidable numbers and high technology of the Tau and their crude allies thwarted every attempt to capture the world or its star system. Many solar months of terrible fighting ensued, with nothing gained on either side. By late 742 M41, the Crusade's commanders eventually agreed to request from the Tau Watercast for peace talks. The negotiations were successful and the Imperial fleet withdrew from Tau space unmolested, their reason partly being due to the impending approach of the Tyranid Hive fleet, Behemoth. Hive Fleet Gorgon the Tau Empire was invaded by the Tyranid Hive Fleet Gorgon, a splinter fleet of the much larger Hive Fleet Behemoth in 899 M41. The Tyranids of Hive Fleet Gorgon were exceptional in their ability to quickly adapt on a biological level to new circumstances of battle such as evolving immunities to the Tau's energy-based weaponry. This rapid pace of defensive adaptation may have been unique to the Tyranid breed of High Fleet Gorgon, or it may have been a response to conflict with the Tau specifically, who are also a highly adaptable species albeit on a technological rather than biological level. In any case, the combined forces of the Tau and the Imperium's Astra Militarum destroyed High Fleet Gorgon in 903 M41, though only after both humanity and the Tau lost several colony worlds 
to the rapacious Tyranids. The Alliance on Malbead. At some point, the Tau sent an expeditionary force to the Imperial planet of Malbead, where they came into conflict with the Ultramarine Space Marine Chapter in 936 M41. However, the planet proved to be a cursed tomb world when the fighting of the Tau and the Ultramarines awakened the sleeping Necrons from their tomb beneath the surface. In an effort to combat this terrible threat to both species, the Tau and the Ultramarines combined their forces to defeat the Necrons. Once the conflict was over, the Tau were allowed to evacuate their forces by the Ultramarines' chapter master, Manus Kalgar, who proceeded to destroy Malbid through the use of an Exterminatus Order. The War for Kvarium Alpha In 966 M41, the Tau fought against the Astartes of the Space Wolves chapter during the War for Kvarium Alpha. On that ocean world, the Space Wolves drop pods landed deep in the oceans where their occupants, their power armor altered by Space Wolf tech marines to operate in undersea environments, made a move to engage their enemy. On the surface, the battle was fought between the two sides with an equally deadly conflict erupting in the depths of the sea between the Space Wolves and Tau battlesuits. Thunderhawk gunships armed with torpedoes, prop bombs, and missiles were used to great effect against the Tau's hammerhead tanks and Manta gunships. Ultimately, the Space Wolves proved to be the victor in the conflict, though hundreds of Tau and Space Wolf corpses floated to the surface of Kavarium Alpha's World Sea. With their mission complete, the Space Wolves made the long trek back to the land across the seabed. And the Taros Campaign The Taros Campaign was an Imperial military campaign fought by the 4621st Imperial Guard Army and elements of the Adeptus Astartes to reclaim the Imperial Desert Mining World of Taros from the Tau Empire and its crude and human allies of the Taros Planetary Defense Force in 998 M41. The campaign was ultimately unsuccessful for the Imperial forces, who took heavy casualties and losses whilst Taros remained in the possession of the Tau who renamed it Teros. Tau Anatomy and Physiology The Tau physiology is closely tied to their society, with the Tau of each caste effectively being a subspecies of the larger race. This was initially a result of adaptation and evolution to suit the different environments each group of the Proto-Tau species found themselves in on their homeworld of Tau, although interbreeding between the castes was later forbidden by the Ethereals. The Tau are humanoid in shape, although they have hoofed feet and four-digit hats three fingers and one thumb. Their skin is grey-blue, although this can vary in pigmentation between septs and colony worlds. It's rough in texture, leathery, and exudes almost no moisture. Their faces are flat, wide around the eyes, with an eye-shaped slit running from the center of the forehead to where a human's nose would be. Their vision is considered slightly superior to that of humans, 
Their visual spectrum extends a little more into the ultraviolet and infrared wavelengths. However, their pupils do not dilate, giving poorer depth perception and providing slower vision focusing reflexes than humans, particularly in low light conditions. The olfactory organs of a tower are inside the mouth. Physical strength and size varies between Tau castes, with the fire cars being the strongest of their kind, roughly the size and slightly weaker than an average baseline human because the Tau homeworld has gravity slightly weaker than that of Terra. Only two females have ever been illustrated. The first, Commander Shadow Sun, appeared to have a more human face than males, being smoother and sleeker with larger eyes, a nose-like facial feature and a Y-shaped facial slit instead of an eye. It is not known, however, whether Shadow Sun is representative of all female Tau. The second known Tau female, the subject of an imperial dissection by the Magi of the Adeptus Mechanicus, had the facial characteristics of males. The Tau do not possess psychus and, as a result, have little knowledge of the immaterium beyond its existence. This gives them some level of resistance to warp-based powers affecting the mind but it offers little if any protection against physically manifested offensive psychic powers. This is because the Tau have virtually no psychic presence in the warp. To a demon or any psychers possessed of the witch sight, they appear as a shifting will of the wisps, rather than the burning fire that represents a human soul. As such, they can never possess or develop psychic powers. The Tau are largely unaware of the perils of the Immaterium, and for this reason have conducted research into the nature of the warb on Medusa 5. However, the conclusion was reached that further research was unfeasible, and that the warp is no place for the greater good is best left to those foolhardy races who cannot pull back from that terrible realm. Ethereal cast members also have a diamond-shaped bony ridge on their head. It is believed by Imperial scholars that through this organ, the Ethereals exert a pheromone-based or latent psychic control over the other Tau castes to keep them focused on the greater good. Thus, this is mere speculation, and no evidence of this has yet been found. Due to their notable absence of psychic ability, the Tau have no equivalent to the navigators of the Imperium, forcing them to travel at sub-light relativistic speeds. The interstellar vessels therefore take much longer than imperial vessels to traverse the vast distances between the stars, which is one reason their empire has expanded relatively slowly over the centuries. Their warriors receive only limited training in the arts of close combat usually depending on crude mercenaries to fight in the horrible melees so common in the 41st millennium. However, due to the Tau's superior range of vision in the electromagnetic spectrum and predilection for patience, the Tau have proven themselves to be extremely efficient sharpshooters with the ranged plasma weapons and railguns they primarily rely upon. The Tau tend to look upon other intelligent species as backwards or misguided. Before the commencement of hostilities, they almost always try to reason with their opponents and establish some kind of agreement that will make the use of military force unnecessary. 
Noted exceptions to this policy are Tau battles with the Orcs, Tyranids, and the forces of chaos, with whom they have little to no diplomatic relations. The Tau see no way to reason with them, and do not want them in their empire. The Greater Good The Greater Good, or Tauva, is the central philosophy that unites all Tau. It teaches that every self-aware being is equal and plays an important part in society. It tells its adherents to put away petty squabbles and unnecessary things to unite for the greater good of the rest of their species and of all other intelligent species in the galaxy. The Tao have no desire to destroy another intelligent species' religion or culture, though it may not mean that they respect their right to live as they please. However, while many embrace this ideology, and even some imperial worlds have willingly joined the Tau Empire, other species fiercely resist adhering to the greater good to pursue their own freedoms, much to the dismay of the Tau, who see these desires as selfish and unenlightened. Now on to the Tau caste system. The Tau employ a caste-based social system that places the good of the many over the good of the few or the individual. In Tau culture, every person is viewed as an essential part of the whole society, though no individual is ever considered more important than the needs of the rest of the society. Social standing is judged primarily by a being standing within a caste, with the suffix la designated the lowest rank in the caste, shazla, fire warrior, fiola, earth worker, porla, water bureaucrat, and the suffix o designated the highest, shas o, fire commander, fio o, earth planner, po o. Water Ambassador. The castes are as follows. First up, the Earth Caste, or Fior. The Earth Caste is composed not only of the Tau's laborers and technicians, but also artisans, scientists, and engineers. They are usually credited with the significant leaps in technology that the Tau Empire has enjoyed. The members of the Earth caste form the foundations upon which the Empire is built. The inhabitants of this caste are generally short and stout of build. The Water Caste, or Poor. The Water Caste is primarily composed of Tao merchants and diplomats. They are tasked with seeking and maintaining diplomatic relations with the other member species of the Empire as well as maintaining the ease of communication and cooperation between the other castes. The water castes are generally taller and slimmer than other Tau, and favor diplomatic training and social grace over confrontation or combat. They are more capable in communicating in the languages of other intelligent species than most other Tau. From the time when they discover the existence of the Imperium, there are several accounts where water cast ambassadors were dispatched to Imperial worlds, and those worlds accepted the greater good without a fight to become new Tao sets. The Air Cast or Core. The Air Cast of the Tao function not only as messengers, but also as the bulk of the protection fleet and the merchant fleet. The Tau of the Air Cast are even taller and more slender than the Water Cast, with long, skinny appendages and hollow bones. 
These traits are attributed to their lives, lived mostly in low to zero gravity void ships and void stations. This is exacerbated by air cast reluctance, if not outright refusal, to land on planets, as their skeletons have atrophy to the point where injury and broken bones are commonplace when they spend time in a gravity well. In the past, during the time of the Montau, before the unification of the Tau tribes, the air cast had membranes stretching between their limbs, which allowed them to glide on air currents. Their pilots are recognized as generally superior to human pilots due to their better fighter craft, though they lack a normal Imperial pilot's level of combat experience. And of course, the Ethereal caste, the Aoun. The Ethereals are the political and religious leaders of the Tao. They resemble the fire and water cast physically, but are marked by a diamond-shaped ridge of raised bone in the center of their foreheads. Their origins are unknown, and most will never refuse a request made by an ethereal. They are sometimes also found on the battlefield, but whether as leaders or observers remains to be seen. The leader of the ethereal caste is a Tau named Aun Va, the ethereal supreme and master of the undying spirit who chair the ethereal high council and served as the head of state or Aun O of the Tau Empire. Ethereal Control One of the theories surrounding the Tau concerns the Ethereal's method of political control over others of their species, and how they initially managed to unite a fractured, nomadic species comprised of multiple and mutually antagonistic subspecies constantly at war into a single people and military force. The proposed causes of this range from the psychic to the biological, including that the ethereal's diamond-shaped forehead ridge, an organ unique to that caste's anatomy, produces a set of pheromones that make Tau and to a lesser extent other intelligent species open to suggestion. And now for the Tau caste rag. The rank of a person in Tao society is second only to the caste they are born into in determining their position in their culture. The ranks are as follows, with the prefix denoting the individual's caste preceding the suffix that determines rank within the caste. First up, we have the Sal, a cadet. This rank is typically given to Tau as soon as they enter the service of any of the castes, where the term might also translate more appropriately as apprentice. Then the La, the first and lowest true rank of Tau society. A fire caste Shaz La would be a standard fire warrior, while an earth caste Fio La would be a manual laborer, and an air cast Korla, a crewman on a Tau void ship. Then the Ui, the second rank among the Tau. A fire cast Shaz Ui would be the leader of a squad of fire warriors, equivalent to an Imperial Space Marine sergeant, or a Tau battlesuit pilot, while a water cast Por Ui would be a mid-ranking envoy or diplomat. Then the Vre, the third Tau rank. A firecast Shaz Vre is a battlesuit team leader or bodyguard. An earthcast Fio Vre would be the foreman of a Tau factory, and an aircast Kor Vre a fighter pilot. 
then the L, the fourth and second highest rank, acknowledge as one of high esteem. Firecast Shaz El are sub commanders, essentially junior Tau commanders. Aircast Kor El command Voidcraft as their captains, and an Earthcast Fio El would be a senior engineer. And of course, or the highest Tau rank in any caste. An air caste Kor Or would be the title of a fleet admiral, while a fire caste Shas Or would be a top fire caste field commander, essentially a general and a fearsome warrior in their own right, usually placed in command of one or more Kadas, or even a contingent. An Aun Or is the highest rank of Ethereal, as Ethereal Supreme and head of the Ethereal High Council, revered by all Tower as the leader of their people. Before the unification of the Empire under the rule of the Ethereals, the four main castes, fire, earth, water, and air, were constantly vying for power with each other in the form of different tribes and subspecies. The sudden appearance of the mystical Tau of the Ethereal caste led to the unification under the utilitarian philosophy of the greater good. The Tau are the most open and tolerant of the intelligent star-faring species that we know of. They seem to be the only faction that prefers to settle their differences peacefully when possible. They are appreciative of humans, Eldari, and the other intelligent species, but hold their own values to be superior to those of others because they view themselves as seeking to build an unselfish and enlightened society. Their tolerance also extends to themselves, as they recognize even lowly earth caste Fiola workers as being as important to the operation and well-being of the Tau Empire as the firecasts, Shazvre, battle suit leaders, or even the ethereal supreme Aun Or, who leads the Empire. Tau Names Tau names are closely tied with their lives within the Empire. A Tau's full name always starts with their caste and their rank within that caste, followed by the set planetary system of their birth, followed by their personal name, which is often determined and extended by their notable actions or achievements in life. Thus, the name of the Tau, Shas O Vyur La Shova Caius Montir, would be broken down as follows. Shas, the individual is a member of the fire caste, or who is a high ranking commander and hero, Viorla, who comes from the sept of Viorla, and has a personal name translated as being far sighted, Shova, skilled, Caius, possible variation of Cais, and having seen many battles, Montir, meaning blooded. Spheres of Expansion The rise of the Tau can be seen to develop through five distinct phases, periods of intense growth known to them as Spheres of Expansion. Each of these ways of interstellar colonization is marked by a long building up of resources, after which continual waves of exploratory missions are launched, followed where needed by military campaigns to solidify territorial gains. Once a colony transforms itself into a stable settlement, it then serves as a jumping off point for the next expansion. 
By the end of the millennia-long first sphere expansion as it later came to be called, the Tau Empire had unfurled across the heavens and consisted of 80 full settled and exploited star systems known as Sets. Named after its primary or Sept world, a Sept can include any number of additionally colonized planets or moons in the same system, as well as other holdings such as listening posts, sensor fields, shield satellites, orbital cities, fortress stations, and mining operations. Everything is connected, both by a series of void stations and a massive net of communications and sensor relays strung between major locations within the system. Although it might take many generations to establish itself, each Tau Sept is unique, with its own cultural nuances and varying proportions of the different castes and non-Tau alien populations. Tau Septs Each Tau Sept, as a fully settled Tau star system is known, has its own unique cultural identity, but remains wholly integrated within the greater Tau culture. This cultural identity seems to mainly derive from which Tau caste is more numerous and influential in the given sect. Currently, there are over 20 fully developed septs within the Tau Empire. Each one has its own sept icon or badge which serves as a national identifier of sorts for other Tau within the Empire. The First Sphere Expansion Sets The First Sphere Expansion of the Tau Empire began shortly after their species first achieved spaceflight capabilities. The Tau homeworld and the First Sphere colonies are of major economic and political importance to them, and form the hub of their empire. First we have Tau'un, the first Tau sept established in the empire's history. Tau'un has a chain of enormous orbital docks and controls, the largest of the air-cast void stations. Every sept hosts warships of the Tau Protection Fleet, or Korvatra, but none can boast of more than Tau'un. Then Dianoi, named after the twin moons of its prime sept world, Dianoi has survived long isolation due to a space storm of fierce and unnatural qualities. It has also seen many infamous orc invasions, having been isolated for such a long period of time from the Tau Empire, its inhabitants are considered somewhat rustic and backwards. Then Bork'an. The Sept of Bork'an is a center of Tau learning and academia, and its star system has many rich mining planets. Borkan has a high percentage of earth cars in its population, and fire warriors from here are not infrequently outfitted with prototype weapons and support equipment. Then Dal Eith. Dal Eith Sept was ravaged by the Imperium during the Damocles Crusade. Many of its outer colonies and several cities on its prime Sept world were destroyed. It has recovered quickly thanks to its busy trade ports. Large numbers of aliens can be seen here alongside its famously efficient water cast merchants and diplomats. Then Fal Shia. Many technological innovations have come from this sept. Firecast warriors from Fal Shia are often the first to try out prototype weapons, armor, and system upgrades. Then Viorla. The planet Viorla orbits a binary star, and its name translates as hot-blooded in Low Gothic. 
It is known to produce especially aggressive and skilled warriors. Many orc invasions have been broken by the Sept, and the most respected Firecast Academies reside upon it. And the last one, Sakea. The Sept's prime Sept world of Sakea is the hottest and most densely populated of all Tau worlds, producing more colonization fleets during the Second Sphere expansion than any other. Warriors of Sakea are regarded as particularly honorable by other Tau. The Second Sphere Expansion Sets The Second Sphere Expansion of the Tau Empire began in 18M39, under the orders of Ethereal Supreme Aun Vei of the Whispered Wisdom. With new advances in propulsion technology and an already established interstellar empire, the second phase expansion was marked by more contact with aliens and larger wars. Around 742M41, the Tau Empire first came into conflict with the xenophobic Human Imperium, which launched the Damocles Gulf Crusade in order to keep the Tau's expansion into Imperial-controlled space in check. The retreat of Imperial forces from their space marked the end of the Second Sphere expansion. Of note are the Septs established by the Firecast Commander Farsight during this period. First we have Autal. Autal Prime is a verdant and beautiful sept world where only honored Tau heroes can retire. Then Nedras. For reasons known only to the Ethereals, this once thriving sept has largely been abandoned. Its remaining inhabitants are regarded as untrustworthy, quick tempered, and of a brooding countenance. Then Kelshan, situated near the Perdus Rift, this sept has suffered many invasions and is less trusting of aliens than other Tau. The Kelshan Tau protection fleet and firecast forces have only recently been restored back to full strength after their clashes with High Fleet Gorgon. Tau from this sept have grown mistrustful, solemn, taciturn, unfriendly, and sometimes openly hostile to alien races as a result of their experience with the Tyranids. Then El Siair. El Siair is a densely populated sept with many moons orbiting its prime sept world most of which are mined for the valuable ores used in the construction of battle suits. This sept is known for its poetry and artwork. Its citizens are considered intellectuals and well respected for their creativeness by other Tau. The Earth cars is dominant on El Siair. Then Tash Var, a frontier sept. The Tau of Tashvar have been subjected to frequent orc invasions and pirate raids. As a result, its people have become tenacious and hardy. Then Vashia, known as the world between spheres. This sept was settled near the end of the second sphere expansion, as it took a long period for the earth cast machines to make the air breathable. Major aircast fleets and many orbital defense platforms are docked around the system sept world. And the last one, Te'olku. Te'olku is known for its many large ethereal temples, as well as the alien institutes where many alien ambassadors are brought to be instructed in the ways of Tao culture, society, and the greater good before being assimilated back into their respective homeworld societies. Now, 
for the third and final known expansion. The Third Sphere Expansion sets. The Third Sphere Expansion was begun by the Tau Empire in 977M41 on the world of the ethereal supreme Aunva. The Firecast Commander Shadow Sun was placed in command of the expansion and secured at least two new sets for the Tau Empire. During the Zeist campaign of circa 999M41, Imperial Space Marine forces counterattacked against the Third Sphere expansion, seemingly drawing it to a halt. However, by this time, the Tau Empire had grown to 133% of its size prior to 997M41 largely as a result of the Imperium's distraction during the 13th Black Crusade and its aftermath in circa 999M41. After the withdrawal of Imperial forces from the campaign, the third expansion continued until it ended following the disastrous Second Agrellan Campaign of the same year and increased resistance from the Imperium which led to the assassination of the ethereal supreme, Aunva. Given the stated size increase of the Tau Empire during this early period, the Third Sphere includes many more septs currently unknown to Imperial scholars. I will now name the recognized septs, starting off with Kasim Yen. The first of a handful of new septs found in the Third Sphere expansion, Kasim Yen is one of the many worlds previously claimed by the Imperium. Those human inhabitants who swore fealty to the greater good have been resettled deeper into the Tao Empire to assure their safety and their proper assimilation into the Empire. The Tao colonists of this sept seem to be associated with luck, subtlety, and opportunistic subterfuge. Then, Phi Rios. The Tao occupying the prime sept world of this sept wrested it from the grip of an orc warlord, and cleansing the star system has proven quite costly. Firios is a sept whose air and earth cast pioneers are recognized by the wider empire for a tenacious refusal to accept defeat, tempered by a stoic acceptance of the price all must pay in the furtherance of the greater good. And the last one, Mugulath Bay. Mugulath Bay was formerly the imperial hive world known as Agrelan, that was the gateway to the Dovar system. It was the site of a famous Tau victory at the Battle of Mugulath Bay, a victory won by both Commander Shadow Sun and Ethereal Supreme Aun Va, which had marked the high point of the Third Sphere expansion. After this victory, Mugulath Bay was well on its way to being established as a full-fledged sept. However, shortly after the Prefectia campaign, the Imperium launched a major counterattack against it, determined to reclaim it. In the end, the Tau managed to resist, but the Imperium subjected the planet to an exterminatus action and destroyed it. A small minority of Mugulath Bay's Tau population managed to survive the planetary firestorm unleashed by the Exterminatus thanks to an energy shield dome that was erected by the Earth cast around a single Tau city, Lovash Tau. The survivors were faced with the unsettling truth that they might never be able to travel back to the Tau Empire as their world was now surrounded by Imperial forces. 
Mugulath Bay ultimately had to be abandoned as the entire Damocles Gulf was set ablaze by the Imperial counteroffensive, which effectively separated Imperial space from the Tau Empire. Surviving elements from Mugulaf Bay then attempted to flee to the nearby Far Sight Enclaves, but were set upon by Commander Shawstrike on the order of the Ethereals, who were determined that the Far Sight Enclaves should not see their strength grow. Shawstrike managed to destroy most of the Rebel Tower, but some still managed to escape. Spheres of Expansion The rise of the Tau can be seen to develop through five distinct phases, periods of intense growth known to them as Spheres of Expansion. Each of these ways of interstellar colonization is marked by a long building up of resources after which continual waves of exploratory missions are launched, followed where needed by military campaigns to solidify territorial gains. Once a colony transforms itself into a stable settlement, it then serves as a jumping off point for the next expansion. By the end of the millennia long first sphere expansion as it later came to be called, the Tau Empire had unfurled across the heavens and consisted of 80 full settled and exploited star systems known as Sets. Named after its primary or Sept world, a Sept can include any number of additionally colonized planets or moons in the same system, as well as other holdings such as listening posts, sensor fields, shield satellites, orbital cities, fortress stations, and mining operations. Everything is connected, both by a series of void stations and a massive net of communications and sensor relays strung between major locations within the system. Although it might take many generations to establish itself, each Tau Sept is unique, with its own cultural nuances and varying proportions of the different castes and non-Tau alien populations. Tau Septs Each Tau Sept, as a fully settled Tau star system is known, has its own unique cultural identity, but remains wholly integrated within the greater Tau culture. This cultural identity seems to mainly derive from which Tau caste is more numerous and influential in the given sept. Currently, there are over 20 fully developed septs within the Tau Empire. Each one has its own sept icon or badge which serves as a national identifier of sorts for other Tau within the Empire. The First Sphere Expansion Sets The First Sphere Expansion of the Tau Empire began shortly after their species first achieved spaceflight capabilities. The Tau homeworld and the First Sphere colonies are of major economic and political importance to them, and form the hub of their empire. First we have Taun. The first Tau Sept established in the Empire's history, Taun has a chain of enormous orbital docks and controls the largest of the air-cast void stations. Every Sept hosts warships of the Tau Protection Fleet, or Korvatra, but none can boast of more than Taun. Then Dianoi. Named after the twin moons of its prime sept world, Dianoi has survived long isolation due to a space storm of fierce and unnatural qualities. 
It has also seen many infamous orc invasions. Having been isolated for such a long period of time from the Tau Empire, its inhabitants are considered somewhat rustic and backwards. Then Bork An. The Sept of Bork An is a center of Tau learning and academia, and its star system has many rich mining planets. Borkan has a high percentage of earth cars in its population, and fire warriors from here are not infrequently outfitted with prototype weapons and support equipment. Then Dal Eith. Dal Eith Sept was ravaged by the Imperium during the Damocles Crusade. Many of its outer colonies and several cities on its prime Sept world were destroyed. It has recovered quickly thanks to its busy trade ports. Large numbers of aliens can be seen here alongside its famously efficient water cast merchants and diplomats. Then Fal Shia. Many technological innovations have come from this sept. Firecast warriors from Fal Shia are often the first to try out prototype weapons, armor, and system upgrades. Then Viorla. The planet Viorla orbits a binary star, and its name translates as hot blooded in low Gothic. It is known to produce especially aggressive and skilled warriors. Many orc invasions have been broken by the Sept, and the most respected Firecast Academies reside upon it. And the last one, Sakea. The Sept's prime Sept world of Sakea is the hottest and most densely populated of all Tau worlds, producing more colonization fleets during the Second Sphere expansion than any other. Warriors of Sakea are regarded as particularly honorable by other Tau. The Second Sphere Expansion Sets The Second Sphere Expansion of the Tau Empire began in 18M39, under the orders of Ethereal Supreme Aun Vei of the Whispered Wisdom. With new advances in propulsion technology and an already established interstellar empire, the second phase expansion was marked by more contact with aliens and larger wars. Around 742 M41, the Tau Empire first came into conflict with the xenophobic Human Imperium which launched the Damocles Gulf Crusade in order to keep the Tau's expansion into Imperial controlled space in check. The retreat of Imperial forces from their space marked the end of the Second Sphere expansion. Of note are the Septs established by the Firecast Commander Farsight during this period. First we have Autal. Autal Prime is a verdant and beautiful sept world where only honored Tau heroes can retire. Then Nedras. For reasons known only to the Ethereals, this once thriving sept has largely been abandoned. Its remaining inhabitants are regarded as untrustworthy, quick tempered, and of a brooding countenance. Then Kelshan, situated near the Perdus Rift, this sept has suffered many invasions and is less trusting of aliens than other Tau. The Kelshan Tau protection fleet and firecast forces have only recently been restored back to full strength after their clashes with High Fleet Gorgon. Tau from this sept have grown mistrustful, solemn, taciturn, unfriendly, and sometimes openly hostile to alien races as a result of their experience with the Tyranids. Then El Siair. 
El Siair is a densely populated sept with many moons orbiting its prime sept world, most of which are mined for the valuable ores used in the construction of battle suits. This sept is known for its poetry and artwork. Its citizens are considered intellectuals and well respected for their creativeness by other Tau. The Earth cars is dominant on El Siair. Then, Tashvar, a frontier sect. The Tau of Tashvar have been subjected to frequent orc invasions and pirate raids. As a result, its people have become tenacious and hardy. Then, Vashia, known as the world between spheres. This sept was settled near the end of the second sphere expansion as it took a long period for the earth cast machines to make the air breathable. Major air cast fleets and many orbital defense platforms are docked around the system sept world. And the last one, Te'olku. Te'olku is known for its many large ethereal temples as well as the alien institutes where many alien ambassadors are brought to be instructed in the ways of Tao culture, society, and the greater good before being assimilated back into their respective homeworld societies. Now for the third and final known expansion. The Third Sphere Expansion Sets The Third Sphere Expansion was begun by the Tau Empire in 977M41 on the world of the ethereal supreme Aun Va. The Firecast Commander Shadow Sun was placed in command of the expansion and secured at least two new sets for the Tau Empire. During the Zeist campaign of circa 999M41, Imperial Space Marine forces counterattacked against the Third Sphere expansion, seemingly drawing it to a halt. However, by this time, the Tau Empire had grown to 133% of its size prior to 997M41 largely as a result of the Imperium's distraction during the 13th Black Crusade and its aftermath in circa 999M41. After the withdrawal of Imperial forces from the campaign, the third expansion continued until it ended following the disastrous second Agrellan campaign of the same year and increased resistance from the Imperium which led to the assassination of the ethereal supreme Aun Va. Given the stated size increase of the Tao Empire during this early period, the Third Sphere includes many more septs currently unknown to Imperial scholars. I will now name the recognized septs, starting off with Kasim Yen. The first of a handful of new septs found in the Third Sphere expansion, Kasim Yen is one of the many worlds previously claimed by the Imperium. Those human inhabitants who swore fealty to the greater good have been resettled deeper into the Tao Empire to assure their safety and their proper assimilation into the Empire. The Tao colonists of this sept seem to be associated with luck, subtlety, and opportunistic subterfuge. Then, Firios. The Tao occupying the prime sept world of this sept wrested it from the grip of an orc warlord, and cleansing the star system has proven quite costly. Firios is a sept whose air and earth cast pioneers are recognized by the wider empire for a tenacious refusal to accept defeat, tempered by a stoic acceptance of the price all must pay in the furtherance of the greater good. 
and the last one, Mugulath Bay. Mugulath Bay was formerly the imperial hive world known as Agrelan, that was the gateway to the Dovar system. It was the site of a famous Tau victory at the Battle of Mugulath Bay, a victory won by both Commander Shadow Sun and Ethereal Supreme Aun Va, which had marked the high point of the Third Sphere expansion. After this victory, Mugulath Bay was well on its way to being established as a full-fledged sept. However, shortly after the Prefectia campaign, the Imperium launched a major counterattack against it, determined to reclaim it. In the end, the Tau managed to resist, but the Imperium subjected the planet to an exterminatus action and destroyed it. A small minority of Mugulath Bay's Tau population managed to survive the planetary firestorm unleashed by the Exterminatus thanks to an energy shield dome that was erected by the Earth cast around a single Tau city, Lovash Tau. The survivors were faced with the unsettling truth that they might never be able to travel back to the Tau Empire as their world was now surrounded by Imperial forces. Mugulath Bay ultimately had to be abandoned as the entire Damocles Gulf was set ablaze by the Imperial counteroffensive, which effectively separated Imperial space from the Tau Empire. Surviving elements from Mugulath Bay then attempted to flee to the nearby Far Sight Enclaves, but were set upon by Commander Shaw Strike on the order of the Ethereals, who were determined that the Far Sight Enclaves should not see their strength grow. Shaw Strike managed to destroy most of the Rebel Tower, but some still managed to escape. Now onto the other Tau worlds and settlements. In addition to the settled star systems or sets, the Tau realm is rife with all manner of spatial phenomenon. Tau made orbital structures, fortress stations, orbital cities, lesser void stations, and important alien homeworlds. There are also more sparsely populated colonies that are not accepted into the Empire as full sets. Only a few names of such colonies are known to the Imperium. I will name the most memorable. First up, Arkunasha. The planet of Arkunasha was settled during the Second Sphere expansion. Despite the aridity of the oxide deserts that made up the world's surface, the Tau had settled the Red Planet with a sizable population. This they had achieved through the tireless work of the Earth caste scientists and engineers. By their efforts, the Empire had girded the planet with two necklace-like strings of biodomes that ran around the most temperate latitudes each a mirror distance from the equator. From orbit, the world appeared as a blood-red globe adrift in the ocean of space, banded with two rows of bioluminescent lights that pulsed bluish-white like the flanks of some deep-sea organism. In their preliminary investigations during the earliest expeditions to Arkunasha's surface, the Earth cast had made a disturbing discovery. Whilst determining the source of the oxide deserts that covered the world, they found a great variance in the metallic composition and even origin of the various particulates. It was as if the world had been entirely covered in metal structures 
at some time in the distant past, which had long since been utterly ground to dust. Given the depth of the oxide residue, that ancient civilization must have included several artificial cities the size of mountain ranges. Theories abounded throughout the Earth cast about the planet-wide catastrophe that had torn everything upon the planet's surface apart. Though the Tau had no idea what might have caused Arkunasha's spectacular death or what the inhabitants might have been, they had taken their first glimpse of the world-destroying power of the Imperium's exterminatus actions. Then, Dal Eth. Before the coming of the Tau, the indigo planet of Dal Eth was a wild ecosystem of deep blue foliage and slithering, segmented beasts. It was tamed long ago during the first sphere expansion and has been brought into compliance with prime level colony standards ever since. Because of the high proportion of water cast members upon its surface, it has enjoyed extremely beneficial trade agreements and has recently been counted as one of the 19 wonders of the Tau Empire. Much of its surface is covered with a tessellating hexagonal net of cities and sub-cities, each connected to the nearest conurbations by a splaying and perfectly regular network of transit tubeways. Clean, white magna rail trains whisk the populace to and fro, detaching and picking up carriages with slingshot efficiency so that they never have to stop. Though the planet has landscaped hills and even gigantic hexagonal reservoirs dotted across it, from orbit it looks as if the Tau have settled it with the precision of an earth cast scientist modeling a new atomic phenomenon. Then Kamais. Kamais was invaded by the Tyranids High Fleet Gorgon in 902M41. A hidden Necron fleet emerged from Kamais's dead moon and destroyed the outnumbered Tyranid bioships, but then continued to land on it and eradicate its population to retake the world for the Necron's own. Then Korvatra, known as the Tau Protection Fleet, and Kor Shuto, orbital cities. Incorporated into every sept are dozens of major docks for the Tau Protection Fleet, but in addition to these immense void stations, many septs have also developed vast orbital cities. These can be moved to provide stable jumping off points for large Tau research endeavors, military campaigns, or major colonization efforts. Then the Red Sun Systems. Tau probes have marked the dense cluster of planets around a string of six distinct red suns. However, the massive orc population has deterred any further colonization of the region. The star systems are ringed with Tau sensor buoys in hopes of offering early warning should the green skins ever cease their internal fighting and seek to menace neighboring systems. Then, Taros. Taros was recently settled during the Third Sphere expansion. This was an imperial world that was willingly annexed by the Tower after opening commercial relations with the Xenos Empire. The resulting imperial attempt to retake the world was defeated by the Tau during what became known as the Taros Campaign. Then, Tashiro. Positioned in the deep space between sets are Tau Tashiro bases, fortress stations capable of enough thrust to resist gravitic drift and maintain permanent interstellar positions. 
several patterns of development have been followed in the construction of these enormous floating fortresses, with the largest comparable in population to a continent-sized city. And the Zone of Silence. A devastated region where High Fleet Gorgon left behind many barren planets scoured of all life forms. Now moving on to the non-Tau world. During the first sphere expansion, the homeworlds and colonies of the Crute and of the Vespid were also incorporated into the Empire. Interestingly, these star systems are not considered sets by the Tau. In addition, there are an unknown number of former Imperial worlds within the Tau Empire some or all of which might still have a human population. Now I will name the most memorable of these worlds. First, Pech. The Crude are the most common of the alien auxiliaries in service to the Tau Empire, and dozens of crude enclaves can be found among the sets. Although they are a far-flung and migratory species, all crude eventually feel the pangs that lead them to return to their birth world, the true home of all crude kindreds, the world of Pech. There are eight star systems in the Tau Empire inhabited by them, including Pech. The Imperium knows only the name of the planet Krath, where the Tau first encountered the crude. Then, Roksh 16. Roksh 16 is the site of a secret Tau listening post. The planet was part of the Roksh system that was home to the Rokshashi Wealth Web Merchant Guild before the entire star system was consumed by the Tyranid Hive Fleet Gorgon in 689-902-M41. Then, Shah Galud. Shah Galud is the homeworld of the Nagi, a small Xenos species of highly intelligent worms known for their mind control abilities. When first discovered by the Tau, the Nagi were hated creatures known as mind worms. But since the early violent conflicts, they have agreed to a peace accord and join the Tau Empire. Many of them now serve as valued advisors to the ethereal caste. And Vespid. Vespid is a benighted gas giant that also just happens to be the homeworld of the insectoid Vespid species. This world is also known for its rich crystal mines. The Earth cast discovered that these crystals have many intriguing technological uses. Now moving on to the Artifact World. There are three so-called Artifact Worlds located within the borders of the Tau Empire. As the name indicates, Ancient artifacts of unknown origin have been discovered on these planets. It is not known if these worlds possess established colonies. First up we have Arthas Moloch. The artifact world of Arthas Moloch is as grey and desolate as a tomb. Its surface is jumbled with thousands of tumble-down shrines and strange faceless statues that predate any of the human colony worlds of the Imperium. The world's surface is cracked and broken, giving the sense that the planet itself died long ago, an impression that is reinforced by the fact that not a single green shoot or patch of moss can be found anywhere on its surface. Not a single living soul makes a home there though the plaster walls of the planet's tombs bear the dark brown smears of bloodshed 
ghostly shadows have been burned into the walls wherever the ruins cluster closer together. Though the world is barren as bone, if one possessed of psychic abilities were to behold it with the witch side, it would shine like a gold mine in firelight. The shrine hall is peppered with artifacts of ancient mysterious origin, each a priceless wonder left discarded in the dust. Arthas Moloch is also known as a dead world to the Imperium, and it is where Commander Farsight discovered the Dawn Blade. Then Q15 and Landfall. And to finish things off, the Far Sight Enclave. Although not a part of the Tau Empire, this breakaway Tau faction led by Commander Farsight is known to have settled beyond the region known as the Damocles Gulf and is named the Farsight Enclaves. These enclaves still believe in the Tauva, the philosophy of the greater good but operate without the guidance of the ethereals. The exact names of these fire cast led sets are unknown to the wider empire, as the armed fortress stations defending them have proven effective at destroying any probe sent to it. When sighted generations later, these forces and fleets bore markings similar in design to those used by the Empire, but in colors and patterns never sanctioned by the Ethereals. Like any distant Tau colony, much of the war gear, support equipment and armor used by those within the Farsight Enclaves is slightly dated. The equipment most prevalent at the time of Farsight's disappearance several Tehran centuries ago. There has been, however, unsettling evidence of classified technology and recent Tau prototypes present within the Enclave. Time will tell whether this is the result of spycraft, theft or defectors from the Empire who have been aiding those within Farsight's domain.